Hi, everyone, and welcome to Proud Identities, a streaming event celebrating LGBTQ community and art. My name is Jen LaBarbera. My pronouns are they and she, and I am the Education and Advocacy Manager at San Diego Pride. I'm really excited to have this collaboration with the museum, and I wanted to um, first, actually, uh, we have an ASL interpreter who will be joining me on screen in just a second. And there they are. So um, I wanted to thank our ASL interpreters for being able to uh, be here and make this event accessible to our deaf and hard of hearing community as well. And uh, so I'm gonna uh, welcome you again so that our interpreter can uh, interpret this. So welcome to Proud Identities a streaming event celebrating the LGBTQ community and art. My name is Jen LaBarbera. My pronouns are they and she, and I'm the Education and Advocacy Manager here at San Diego Pride. And so this is a new collaboration between the San Diego Museum of Art and San Diego Pride. And I'm, I am truly so excited uh, to get started here. As a quick kind of, you know, preview intro, the LGBTQ community and the art world have always been deeply intertwined. Uh, the, uh, but the artistic canon has sometimes, often, dismissed the contributions of LGBTQ artists and erased LGBTQ themes in art. The art world, of course, is not immune to the same influence of a white supremacist heteropatriarchy that we all live under. So artists, museums, and other folks in the arts world have been working for years to undo that damage. And so um, we have worked with our folks at the museum to kind of help, help do that, help undo that damage. So we are gonna start with a virtual tour that our friends at the museum have put together. And that is gonna go through some of the museum's collections and their connections to or about LGBTQ culture and community. After that, we're gonna move into a Q&A panel with some Museum of Art staff that will be moderated by the incredible and wonderful Larry Baza. And so we are gonna get started on that video in just a minute. I also wanna say, feel free to um, post in the comments on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching. And if we are able, we've pulled together some questions, but if we're able to get to some of your questions that you post in the comments, we'll um, shuffle that over to Larry as the moderator and hopefully he'll be able to um, work those in. If he can't work those in, then our museum staff will jump into the comments on Facebook and YouTube after the show and, uh, and engage with y'all as well. And so uh, the, I know that right now the video is also loading because this is the uh, lovely part of uh, doing live events is that sometimes things go a little bit, a little bit haywire. So I am uh, talking, continuing to talk and just buy some time. And so I believe we are almost ready and I'm gonna wait for our producer backstage to let me know that we are good to go. All right. We, we have a let's try this, so let's go for it. All right, a little bit of an issue with the audio. Uh, we will be, it's coming, I promise y'all. And it is really good. Um, I believe there may have, there may also be some uh, farm animals that you might get to see at some point. Um, Easter egg for you there. In the meantime, you'll just get to look, um, you know, watch uh, me and the ASL interpreter. And actually, Bailey, our lovely friend from the museum, is going to hop on and just, uh, you know, help just banter a little bit with me, Bay. Hi. Hey, good to see you, Jen. Good to um, see welcome, you. everyone, to Proud Identities. Sorry, we're experiencing a few technical issues. 
Um, but we're hoping to get this sorted out. So I'm gonna jump a little bit on what we were gonna talk about after the program, but I just wanted to give a quick background on this project and a little bit about where it came from and what we were hoping to do with this tour. So originally our partnership was envisioned as a live event that would take place on the museum's front steps. Um, but of course, because of the pandemic, we had to postpone that. Um, but a part of that whole event was the idea that once everybody enjoyed the music, the dancing, the performances outside the museum, they would be able to go into the museum and load up this tour on their phones or um, you know, with a docent and move through the museum and looking at works of art through an LGBTQIA plus lens. And part of what we hope to do with this tour was not just touch on artists who have self-identified as LGBTQ, but look at artworks that, um, that speak to those identities and to speak to different expressions of gender throughout history, throughout, um, throughout uh, the world. And so that's what really got us excited about this tour. So we knew that even though the outdoor event would have to be canceled, um, we still wanted to move ahead with, with this tour. And so it will actually be available on our app, um, which is SDMA. You can, you can find it, load it on your phone. We've got lots of other content on there as well, but this tool will exist on our app. And then also um, for the ease of, of those who maybe aren't as familiar or don't have a smartphone, we decided to make this video version that would also be available on YouTube for people to enjoy. Awesome. Yeah. And I know that um, we are, we're almost there. Yeah. We're at like 93% of, of getting to the video uh, to come up. So in the meantime, um, yeah, I know that the, the museum has, um, when Bailey came to us and asked for a partnership. So part of my job at San Diego Pride is to help manage all of the community partnerships that we have with organizations and uh, groups around San Diego. And we've had a little bit of a hard time getting, um, or in the past, not in the past like two, three years, but prior to that, we haven't really had much of a foothold in anywhere in Balboa Park. And that's really quickly changing. It feels like it's like a quick shift. Um, and so I'm just really stoked that we get to continue to build that Balboa Park uh, institutions partnership. Balboa Park is, is the gem of our city. And so uh, it's not too. queer, then what is it, right? Yeah. Right, so. yeah, I'm hoping that we can be the first institution in a long line of many who, who partner with Pride and bring these kinds of events to their institutions. Balboa Park's such an amazing place. We're so fortunate to have it in San Diego just you know, on our on our back our back doorstep, um, yeah. and it seems like such a wonderful opportunity to bring these kinds of events and performances and celebrations to the park. I, I'm really excited to see where it builds from here, not only in our museum but in institutions around the park. Same, yeah. And so we've had that that partnership with San Diego History Center, right? When they created that beautiful exhibit, yeah. Um, and you know, we got to light up Bubble Park in Rainbow a couple of years ago, and then again last year during Pride Week. Um, but yeah, we're gonna gay up that park, and right now we're gonna try again with the video, and we're gonna also queer up the art world. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. Hello and welcome to the San Diego Museum of Art. My name is Bailey Kane and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here. And on behalf of the entire staff, it's our pleasure to welcome you. We are so proud to be announcing a new partnership with San Diego Pride. We had a lot of incredible events planned for you this year that unfortunately had to be temporarily postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, in the meantime, it's my pleasure to introduce Lucas Perez, the Education and Public Programs Assistant, who will be leading you through a very special tour of some of the pieces in the museum's collection. Enjoy. Thank you, Bailey, and welcome to Proud Identities, a virtual tour that takes a fresh look at our permanent collections to assemble artworks from around the world and across time that speak to LGBTQ plus identities in art. So what does that mean? 
It means that we've conducted a thorough re-examination of artworks in our vaults to pull examples by LGBTQ plus identifying artists, but also to look at ancient and pre-modern artworks that depict historical notions of a gender spectrum, queer sexuality, and identity. One place to find early examples of depictions of a gender spectrum, for example, is actually in religious art. And religious iconographies around the world have long made use of androgynous gender cues to communicate the non-binary gender of supernatural beings. Our first stop is in the Gupta Empire, which existed in northwestern India from the 3rd century to 543 of the Common Era. So without further ado, let's do it. Iconographies from religious traditions around the world have long made use of androgynous gender cues to communicate the non-binary gender of supernatural beings. Art that emerges from the Gupta Empire, which existed from the 3rd century to 543 CE in northwestern India, is especially replete with evidence of historical notions of a gender spectrum. Examples like the male and female composite form of Lord Shiva and his consort Parvati represent the essential female nature of the male principle of God and the perfect balance of masculine and feminine energies. Gupta period artists also began depicting the Buddha more androgynously with sloping shoulders, softened musculature, slender fingers, and a gentle downward gaze that gave the sculptures an aura of meditative tranquility. This style of image making proliferated along the Silk Road as Buddhism spread to East Asia. In Edo period Japan, the cult of youthful male beauty was an important theme in art centered around adolescent boys known as wakashu. Notions regarding the age of consent were very different from our own, and in a period where girls sometimes married as young as age 12, boys were also considered acceptable objects of desire. Popular literature of the time, including the tale of Genji, where a character named Genji is disinherited by his father, the emperor, portray Wakashu as both tragic heroes and passionate lovers. Wakashu were also prominently depicted in ukiyo-e with block prints, and are often only distinguishable from female figures by their hairstyle of long locks at the ears and a shaved patch atop the head. In kubuki theater, where cross-dressing was routine practice, well-known wakashi roles could be played by actors of any sex. It's this gender fluidity that has some scholars referring to wakashu as Japan's historical third gender. Art history can also teach us a lot about the evolution of gender expression over time and cross-culturally. And in many cases, art is our only window into how fashion, gendered beauty standards, and social norms dictated how people constructed gender performances in the past. The next stop on our tour is in Persia, and it's courtly art. Let's go. Artworks such as this Persian tile present the viewer with historical expressions of gendered beauty that in many cases stand in direct contrast to the standards of today. Art from Iran of the Qajar period, which lasted from 1789 to 1925, often depicts men and women in similar clothing, although with different headgear, and distinctive monobrows, that is, eyebrows that are conjoined with a single line of hair. Qajar women also grew faint mustaches accentuated with mascara, while men, as seen in this charming garden scene, were clean-shaven. There's a lot of speculation about why female facial hair became so desirable and celebrated during this era of Persian history, but it was certainly not the only culture to embrace it. Ancient Greeks, Babylonians, Celts, and Byzantines also adopted this beauty standard, while modern artist Frida Kahlo sported a monobrow as a way of opposing prevailing beauty norms. One of the quirky hallmarks of European infant portraiture from about 1550 to 1900 is depictions of children, regardless of sex, dressed in little gowns that only varied slightly between boys and girls. The practice was more a result of practicality than a statement of sex or gender expression, as this style of garment made it easier to care for children who hadn't yet been toilet trained. Young boys stopped wearing dresses after a breaching rite of passage ceremony when they first were allowed to wear pants or breeches. In this portrait, Prince Chigi of Rome is wearing a coral necklace and matching bracelets meant to protect him from illnesses like smallpox. This image is a fascinating example of how clothing and accessories as indicators of gender expression have evolved over time. The arts have always been a traditional safe base for LGBT artists and their art. Societies throughout history have constructed parameters for acceptable homosexual behavior and often depicted homosexuality in their art. Renaissance art is especially replete with examples. 
Artists like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Caravaggio, and Titian are the first openly homosexual artists, as we may call them, whose histories we know today. Our next stop is in Germany and the Northern Renaissance. Let's go. When Albrecht Dürer completed this woodblock print of his friend Ulrich von Bühler in 1522, the distinction between heterosexuality and homosexuality did not exist. Same-sex relationships between men were considered part of a wider spectrum of male sexuality, although acts now considered to be homosexual and their punishments were popular topics of discourse at the time, especially within the church. Durer depicted homoerotic content in his artwork throughout his lifetime, and wrote letters to his friend Willibald Perkheimer, which confirmed the artist's interest in male beauty and same-sex relationships. It's impossible to know whether Durer was homosexual as we understand it today, or whether his preferences were a result of a culture of learned homosexuality that proliferated among artistic and literary circles of the Renaissance. Durer's homoerotic art, however, exemplifies the importance of understanding his works within their historical context, free of contemporary definitions of sexuality. Despite a professed opposition to bourgeois conservatism, the early American avant-garde movement was not necessarily accepting of homosexuality. American artists Charles DeMuth and Marsden Hartley met in 1907 at a Paris cafe. The two men became lifelong friends and were the two most prominent gay male artists of the early American avant-garde. Despite being a close friend of DeMuth, playwright Eugene O'Neill created a character in his play Strange Interlude named Charles Marsden, an amalgam of the two artists' names, whose onstage frustrated sexuality reveals homophobic stereotypes of their day. O'Neill wrote that Charles Marsden is one of those poor devils who spend their lives trying not to discover what sex they belong to. This is but one published example of literary caricatures based on DeMuth and Hartley that represent homosexuality as a dysfunction rather than embracing it as a subversive counterculture identity within the avant-garde. Women have always struggled for representation in the arts. Traditionally, women were usually relegated to craft work, and until the 20th century, there were very few women working as professional artists. The modern era saw the emergence of many successful pioneering women in the arts whose work deconstructed social conventions that usually kept women out of the arts. The heyday of modern art was dominated by powerful male painters, while the work of female artists was considered less serious. One artist who broke through these barriers was Georgia O'Keeffe. Let's take a look. The heyday of modern art was dominated by powerful male painters, while the work of female artists was often dismissed as less serious. Georgia O'Keeffe detested the marginalization of her work and strove to have her paintings recognized on their own merits and not as statements on womanhood. When O'Keeffe began painting close-up views of flowers, shocked male art critics and sympathetic feminists both interpreted the paintings as overtly glorifying female anatomy. Ever the independent thinker, O'Keeffe rebuked this misinterpretation in 1943 by saying, Well, I made you take the time to look at what I saw, and when you took the time to really notice my flower, you hung all your associations with flowers on my flower, and you write about my flower as if I think and see what you think and see of the flower, and I don't. The work of Marie Laurencin was rediscovered in the 1970s by queer art historians interested in her depictions of women and female love, as well as her connections to important early queer feminist groups. Laurent Song was profoundly influenced by Natalie Clifford Barney's neo-sapphic salons, where lesbian and bisexual women gathered to express themselves free of predominating patriarchal social conventions. Within her lifetime, however, it was her relationships with powerful male artists that earned her a position among the avant-garde elite of Paris at the turn of the century. After Pablo Picasso introduced La Rancon to Guillaume Apollonaire, and the two became romantically involved, the great poet described La Rancon as Our Lady of Cubism. In 1911, La Rancon was the only woman to exhibit at the Maison de Cubistes alongside Ferdinand Leger and Marcel Duchamp. Despite her elevated status among the male titans of the art world, La Rancon continued exploring womanhood and queer sexuality in work throughout her life. In 1931, she was a founding member of La Société des Femmes Artistes Modernes, a group that championed female artists active in Paris at the time. 
And finally, we end in the modern and postmodern era, a period during which the LGBT coalition has achieved many history-changing civil rights victories, including, most importantly, marriage equality. The last two artists in our tour express their love openly as an integral part of their identity. Let's take a look. The confidently independent photographer Bernice Abbott was perhaps ahead of her time in her adoption of feminist views. She publicly identified as a lesbian and was open about her 30-year partnership with art critic Elizabeth McClausend in an era where coming out was very rare. Abbott wore slacks and a big overcoat with lots of pockets that she said was more useful for carrying camera supplies and taking photographs than a purse which got in the way. Changing New York is Abbott's seminal documentary photo series commissioned by the Federal Arts Project in 1935 to capture the potential of New York City emerging from Depression-era austerities, as expressed in its towering architecture. Abbott never shied away from visiting some of New York's grittier neighborhoods in pursuit of the perfect angle. And when a male editor quipped that, nice girls didn't go to such places, Abbott replied, I'm not a nice girl, I'm a photographer, I go anywhere. Jasper Johns met Robert Rauschenberg in 1953 while they were collaborating on window displays for high-end department stores in New York City. The two artists began painting together and a romance quickly ensued, during which some of their most iconic artworks were produced, including Rauschenberg's combine paintings and Johns's targets and flags. Together they confected a style of art making that celebrated the banality of everyday objects as a way of counteracting what they saw as the absurd seriousness of abstract expressionism. The art movement they inspired, sometimes referred to as neo-dadaism, would go on to influence the pop art movement, including artists like Andy Warhol, Ultimately, the strain of two successful art careers proved too much for their relationship and they split in 1959, putting it into one of the most important artist romances in modern art. Although the two artists are now good friends. Well, that concludes our video tour. We hope that you learned a little about LGBTQ plus art history and about some of the artworks in our permanent collection that document the evolution of proud identities. As a reminder, it's always better to see art in person. A picture or a video never really fully captures the materiality of an artwork. So we hope to see you soon in one of our galleries. And until then, thank you and happy pride. Rebecca and I really hope you enjoyed that video. Please join us after the credits for a live Q&A and discussion about Proud Identities, SDMA, and San Diego Pride. Lastly, please remember to subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel, hit notifications, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All right, that video was amazing. And so before we get our, uh, our moderator up here, um, I just wanted to, again, just thank, thank Larry, uh, or sorry, thank the San Diego Museum of Art so, so, so much. And Lucas, oh Lord, that chicken. I love that chicken. And maybe during the Q&A, Lucas will tell us more about, um, about the chicken and about, uh, the multiple chickens because I would super love to have um, to have some to know what the names of the other chickens are because um, I know that you have multiple. 
Um, so without further ado, um, I'm gonna introduce Larry. Uh, Larry Baza, as most of y'all might know, is um, a huge, amazing member of the um, LGBTQ community here in San Diego, has been involved with the arts world for years and years and years as well and uh, used to uh, work with the City Arts and Culture Council, has also just is everywhere, all over California, all over, um, all over San Diego. And so we're really excited that we were able to get him as, um, as our, our moderator for this Q&A today. Let's see if Larry is ready to come on up. All right, Larry, you are on screen. Can you hear us? I can hear you. All um, right. It's great to see you, great to be with you, and thank you, Darren, for interpreting for us. We appreciate yes. it. Yes, and Larry, is your, um, can you turn your camera on, or are we just gonna see a cute gray avatar? Well, well show my face, and how do I do that? On the bottom of your screen, there should be something that says stop cam or start cam. Yes, start cam. There's there your face, yay. There I am. All right, Larry, I'm gonna let you take this away and um, enjoy your Q and A and I'll let you introduce the uh, SDMA folks. Thank you so much. I wanna share with the people who are viewing, um, this, this wonderful experience <clears throat> with us, um, share with you um, our other panelists. And I guess we'll be seeing them shortly, <clears throat> but we will have um, Bailey Kane from the San Diego Museum of Art. We will have Lucas Perez, uh, curator of Proud Identities and who you, if you watched earlier, his tour of Proud Identities, a wonderful and exciting exhibition um, that hopefully when we're able to go to the museum again, we'll be able to see these actual works ourselves. Um, we, um, is everybody gonna be online? There's Bailey and there's Lucas Perez and there's Matt Parsiak. Um, this is a very exciting time for me. Um, being a past co-chair of Pride many years ago, uh, maybe before some of you were born, but, um, and also my work in the arts, this is sort of like the, the convening of all my worlds in one place. I can't tell you how important I think it is that San Diego Museum of Art has partnered with the, with San Diego LGBTQ Pride. And I think it's going to set other uh, institutions joining that and, and collaborating and, and making Pride even greater than it already is. You know, for, um, it's so exciting because SDMA, the Museum of Art, has been, has a great long history of bringing culture, visual art culture certainly, and history to San Diego and, and leading that way. And for it to bring its expertise and for Lucas to create proud identities is really a major step. And I congratulate you, Lucas. And I even learned a few things and I'm, and, and, um, I'm one of those folks who thinks I know everything, but I really don't clearly. So first, let's let's talk about how this this show, this this um, collaboration, this partnership. How did it come about, Lucas and and so well, let's start with you and go then to Matt and and Bailey. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, uh, uh, Bailey approached me about uh, seven or eight months ago with this idea about creating a tour. To go in conjunction with our front step or on the steps event uh, that was going to happen. Of course, it got uh, you know uh, uh, sort of delayed because of COVID. Uh, so I went into each one of the galleries and started looking. Of course, my first intuition, intuition was to look for uh, artists that uh, identified as LGBT. Uh, Q plus, and um, I quickly found that you know I was sort of uh, boxed in by artworks that were on view at the time, and so uh, I thought quickly that I was going to have to sort of 
decouple the tour from the artist identity and go uh, to larger issues of gender, gender spectrum, gender performance, uh, queer sexuality. And then once I had done that, that really opened up uh, my ability to, to bring in artworks from all over the world from throughout time um, that really spoke to all kinds of issues that um, sort of transcend just the artist's identity themselves. Um, often when you're looking at these uh, types of curation jobs, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll encounter artists that you know, could have been LGBT, but you don't really want to like uh, out them uh, you know, it, after the fact. So um, I wanted to be also very cognizant of um, only selecting artists if they were LGBT, that they were open about that or in, in um, uh, that, that sort of idea. Um, let's see here, what else are we going to talk about? Uh, so once uh, COVID happened, uh, then the tour was able to sort of get decoupled from our artworks on view. And then I was able to take a very comprehensive look through our entire collection. Uh, and what struck me was, wow, there's so much actually that could speak to so many of these issues that we find important. Um, and it was actually kind of a hard um, task to sort of whittle it down to something that was digestible uh, you know, and that uh, people would enjoy, you know, and, and learn something from. Um, personally, I, I thought it was just fascinating, you know, whatever your opinions are, that there's this just long history of evidence of notions of uh, uh, non-binary gender, of queer sexuality, of all these different things. And um, it's there in the art, you know, I, as I said in the video, um, uh, you know, art is one of the few places where we can actually see depictions of these things. You know, when you read historical texts and that kind of thing, it's very, uh, you know, diluted. But I think the art in, in many ways is is our best window into to that, that history. Very enlightening for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Bailey, would you add to that? Absolutely. So I can speak to uh, the origins of our partnership with SD Pride. Um, and I want to give credit where credit's due. This whole idea came about because um, Matt Parsiak uh, was our Carolyn Wolf intern last summer. And as part of his internship at the museum, he was uh, tasked with developing ideas for a few programs. And one day he came to me and he said, why doesn't the museum do anything with San Diego Pride? And it was like, it's so simple and so obvious, but it, it took him identifying that and pointing that out as, as an obvious collaboration that we should be doing. So um, if you can bring, bring Matt up, I wanted to make sure that he was acknowledged for sort of kicking Hi. this whole thing off. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Your baby's all grown up. Yeah, this is so exciting. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you, Matt. And and as you can see, this has been a really wonderful partnership um, thus far, and we're really excited to see it grow. So kudos to you for for uh, identifying this. This is a potential partnership in the first place. We're, I think both organizations are really grateful to you. So thank, thank you. you. Great job. I mean, it, the video was incredible. I'm so excited to see where this goes. Thanks, Matt. So yeah, after Matt had, yeah, after Matt had, to Matt. Yeah. <laughs> it bodes well for your future in, in visual art in the museum world, and, and thank you for that. Thank this you. Is, is really important. Um, so I think that you know, Lucas, you talked about when when you talked about uh, Charles Demuth and Marsden Hartley and their relationship. Um, and, and you spoke to the stereotypes that, that existed during that time. And clearly um, the message for us from that time was we had a lot of work to, ahead of us as, as, as a community, as a national community, and as a part of a worldwide community. But my question for, for, for you all would be how or when in your opinion, did the art world really begin to speak um, in an honest way and addressing LGBTQ artwork or artists and what became a burgeoning movement? Uh, was there an exhibition? Was there something? What stands out in your knowledge um, in our history, in our country, was what you think part of the turning point where we started to uh, be whole, if you will, uh, from my perspective, I would say, you know, it's actually kind of rather recent um, that the art world has really 
uh, in, embrace these, these sort of LGBT identities in art. Um, I would say the turning point would probably have to be the AIDS epidemic that started in the 80s and went through the 90s. Um, personally, in my experience working in art collections in New York City and going to exhibitions and that type of thing, that's really where you see a large body of works that is consistently exhibited uh, in, in institutions. Uh, artists like David Warnerowitz, uh, Keith Herring, uh, there's just many, many um, that aren't coming to my mind right now. But um, mm -hmm. from, my, from my perspective, I think that's really where I started to see the institution um, really, again, accepting the, the work for what it was, which was talking about queer sexuality, about AIDS, about um, recovery, about you know, all, all those issues at that time in the 90s. That's, that's great. Um, Bailey. Anything to add to that? Uh, uh, I think absolutely Lucas is right. When you have such a big, um, awful event, you know, happening to a specific uh, culture, a specific group of people, I think art has always been a really great way for people to cope with that trauma to express their feelings about that trauma. And I think that the voices that emerged during that time were so powerful that it was very hard to ignore. And, um, and yeah, <laughs> that, would be, that would be my main observation. Good, thank you. You know, when, when you talked about George O'Keefe Lucas and in, in that section, I'm not a woman painter, which I found absolutely, uh, perfect and a wonderful uh, thing to keep in mind uh, when we look at the art world in particular and the secondary position that women artists endured for so many, many, many years. But, um, you know, the quote from George O'Keefe uh, was, was so strong and powerful, but I think that I would share, and, and I would ask you to also share, that you know there have been many artists from African American communities, Native American communities, and the Latinx communities that have made that that statement, I am an artist first, rather than I am a black artist, or I am an Asian artist, I am a woman artist. Well, there are some that do make that distinction. Uh, I think we all should respect um, their choice to be um, judged, if you will, or appreciated on the merit of their work. And and are are you seeing that? Are you Bailey and and Lucas seeing that more in 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 the world of of, of, of contemporary art collecting now? Uh yeah, for me, I, I I think um, one of the sort of leading institutions, if you're going to try to see that um, that trend happening in the art world, would be like, for example, the Whitney, um, that's taken a really proactive uh, uh, way of curating to make sure that the representation on their walls is relatable to the population that that institution is serving. Um, and uh, I, I can I can think of other institutions, but I would say, yeah, there's. Uh, uh, you know, my professor at one point he often would say there's a lot of different art worlds. So um, it depends on which avenue of artwork they're talking about. I would say the institutional art world, world that is the, the the museums, I think, would probably be at the forefront of, of um, addressing these, you know, sort of historic injustices or lack of representation for artists of color or queer artists or in, in many cases also women. I mean, even today, I would say that, you know, I think I saw an Artnet article that was talking about, you know, it's it's still not even 50-50 as far as representation for women on the walls of galleries and museums. So, um, yeah, I would say that institutionally, that's where you're going to see most of the change. The galleries happen or react in, or the commercial galleries react in, in uh, as far as markets and that kind of thing. So they incorporate those things later usually. So that's my own little perspective. Great. Thank you for that. So I... Would, uh, if either of you would share with our viewers here um, any publications, books, or ref recommendations you could make if people are really interested in learning more about LGBTQ artists? Are there, is there anything that comes to mind that you would recommend for people who really want to pursue that uh, in, in, and learn more about it? About LGBTQ presence in the in the uh, in the art world and well, in the market. One general 
um, online publication that I'd recommend is Hyperallergic. Mm -hmm. um, Lucas has actually written a few articles for Hyperallergic, and it doesn't specifically always deal with LGBTQ um, issues in art, but it covers a broad swath of general major issues that the art world, both um, you know, commercial galleries and museums and other institutions are facing in the current day, and how certain institutions are responding. You know, it profiles certain exhibitions, and I've learned a great deal uh, through through reading articles on that website. Mm. I, I would agree with that completely. That's great. Uh, and if you've not visited uh, a major uh, gallery or museum, I should say, in New York City, uh, is the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, uh, which has a very comprehensive collection of artworks. Uh, that, again, not only um, highlight the artworks of LGBT identifying artists, but all kinds of artwork that speak to these issues that are important to the LGBT community. Great. Great recommendations. Um, it, I, I think that. Um, it's important to think about where we, where we go from here. What can we expect in the future? What, what kind of trends are you seeing going forward as an institution that you may be um, looking forward to delving into or exposing? Um, share with us that about SDMA, if you want. Um, well, I can I can jump in. Um, I mean, one thing that obviously has been on our mind in, in recent days is the representation of black artists and artists of color on our walls. Uh, the museum's been looking long and hard and obviously there are gaps in our collection. You know, it really became clear to us in making this tour that, that we didn't have any black queer artists to feature in this particular tour. Um, so I know that the management of the museum has really been thinking a lot about that and we already have plans for numerous acquisitions to help start filling in those gaps. There's a long way to go, but we're taking the steps to, to start adding those voices and, and those representations to our collection. Um, and the beauty of a tour like this too, that li lives in the digital space is that it can be ever evolving. You know, once we have one of those artists in our collection, we can add them to the tour and it can constantly be growing and growing with, with the tour, with, with the collection as we, as we fill in those gaps and add in those really, really crucial voices that we don't, that we don't already have. Lucas, if, if you wanted to add anything, feel free. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, um, you know, we've been, uh, the museum was scheduled to open on the 9th. Um, we've, we've been a little delayed, um, but we do have a Colleen Smith exhibition that's up right now. So that when the museum does open, please come and uh, view the, the exhibition, it's fantastic. So that, that's really great. And I, I maybe um, both of you could share a little bit more about the San Diego Museum of Art in terms of, um, what goes in, what is, what is the process that goes through, that you as curators go through to create a show such as this? Um, I don't think people even have an idea of how many works are in the museum's collection. You might wanna share that. And, and what is your process as you go forward to, to create an exhibition? Um, I know it's, it's it's very intensive and um, you bring all of your education and research to bear on that. So share with us, please. Lucas, that's all you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have to say, um, you know, when you're uh, writing or curating in the capacity or uh, in, you know, uh, representing the museum, it has to go through a lot of pro you know, processes. It goes through um, the review of a lot of different people. Um, so I just began by just kind of wandering through the galleries. It was really a lot of fun. Uh, and then um, uh, jotting down these, net these ideas, doing my research um, and making sure that everything I've said in this tour is backed up by some research and that I'm not making any um, sort of claims that aren't also um, being made by other scholars as well. Um, and then once that's done, I, I pass it on to Bailey and it went through a kind of line of curators who had their chance to edit. Um, and then our editor and then marketing and you know, just kind of gets bounced around all over the place. Um, it really has been quite amazing. You know, when I first started or when Bailey handed this project to me, uh, it was just going to be kind of something, you know, just goes on the app, something re relatively small, but it's just grown and gr the proportions have grown. And I, in a way that's been um, um, somewhat of a silver lining from, from the, the closure for, due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I guess, and then SD Pride got involved, and then I made the video, and my chickens got involved. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was amazing. I will add um, one thing that is a really big benefit of having this be a digital tour is we're a bit more light on our feet um, as far as the works that can be involved. You know, if you're curating an actual show that's going to take place physically in the gallery space, there are restrictions, of course, on you know, whether the piece of art that you'd like to feature is, you know, in a good enough condition to be up and exhibited during that amount of time. So because this was all digital, we could add whatever we want. And like I said before, we can continue to um, add to the tour and incorporate more artists as they're added to our collection. So we get to be a little more, a little more light, light on our toes. And it's a great strategy that you you put forward, and, and uh, it seems to me that in the future um, the the museum might consider doing more of, of this sort of curatorial work that's for online. And we're all all of us in this pandemic are even even um, a couple of my friends who really are further in the dark ages when it comes to IT work um, have said, I've really, they're really watching and really viewing and taking advantage of the opportunities that are online for the work. So I, I, I hope we can expect more of this from the San Diego Museum of Art as it goes forward. I hope so too. <laughs> yes, yes, more of this. They'll be part of it, definitely. So. I mean, it, it, it's a great, um, asset in promoting the shows once we get back to some kind of normalcy when we can actually walk through those great doors and 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 be in the presence of the works there's nothing that will ever change the value of that but this can doing this online and and creating a video such as you did and you did a beautiful job lucas congratulations thank you uh, also credit to bailey <laughs> same to you bailey very very good job so uh, what what is your takeaway, both of you, from from this experience? And um, I'm sure that following this, there'll be more feedback. But what is your takeaway at this point in time? Uh, for me, I'm I'm incredibly energized and um, uh, enthusiastic about the future because I think that um, you know again be because we're, we're kind of in a, an era where we're re-examining every part of our society. Uh, we also need to look at these institutions, art, you know, art institutions, et cetera. Um, and I think it's really exciting because there's so many, opportun so many opportunities that are opening up because of this re-examination of all of our, you know, of our societies. So, yeah. It's great. I think what's really been the most compelling for me is, is really seeing, you know, hard evidence that these kinds of expressions and these, um, you know, the spectrum of gender identity has been absolutely present in artwork from around the world for millennia. And it's not a recent trend. And that was really, really um, moving to me to see evidence of. I also really loved the way that the tour, as, as Lucas described, it took shape moving away from simply identifying LGBT artists and into more of a thematic um, uh, a thematic tour. Uh, I don't come necessarily from an art history background, so oftentimes I may not know that an artist is um, a member of the community just by seeing their name, but it's really energized me to, to bring my own interpretations and my own reactions and to value those uh, when I when I experience a work of art. And uh, just, you know, as Georgia O'Keeffe put it, just because she may not have intended it, uh, <laughs> doesn't mean that it, it can't be something that I interpret and that I feel for myself. So that's been really wonderful. Indeed. So I don't know how much time we have left, but I, I would like for, I, for both of you to kind of share what may be coming up in the next year at the San Diego Museum of Art and what we can look forward to having begun this relationship. And I expect that we, and hope that, um, the partnership will continue next year. And if I have my way, um, I sit on, on a board of another uh, museum in the park and um, I'm gonna work very hard to join the ranks with SDMA being uh, 
part of San Diego Pride. So, Wonderful. Um, well, I'd love to talk about that. So um, as I mentioned briefly at the beginning of the, of the tour, um, this was originally visualized as a, a a steps event, which is uh, an ongoing series of events that we have at the museum. We have them two times a year. They are free outdoor community celebrations. And we usually focus the theme of that celebration on one of the communities represented in the artwork in the museum. So in the past, for example, we, we had an epic tales from ancient India celebration. We've had um, a modern masters from Latin America. We are the last one we did right before the pandemic hit was a Persian celebration. So this, uh, this was originally visualized as part of these free outdoor community parties, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, so we're absolutely going to going to plan on moving forward and having that celebration in June of next year. So everybody mark your calendars. We're aiming to have it um, right around the anniversary of Stonewall. And what you can expect from that um, is we have booths out front where we'll have artists from the Pride community showing their artwork, getting the chance to interact with and speak to um, anybody who cares to stop by. And on the steps of the museum, typically we have performances. And I know that so far um, we're going to be working with the San Diego Queer Youth Chorus, who are going to be doing a performance. And we're also really fortunate to be having a, a performance by Amber St. James, who is going to be doing um, a demonstration of voguing. And, teaching a little bit about ballroom Love culture. It. So I cannot wait for those yeah. things to happen on the front steps of the museum. And of course, everybody can come, enjoy the performances, and then head inside, load up your pride tour, and experience our artwork. Um, I'm really excited. It, it's kind of giving me a little light at the end of the, the COVID tunnel <laughs> to think about for next year. But we're actually absolutely going to be moving forward with that. And I can't wait. It's very, very exciting, and I think it really bodes well. And I, I think I can't think of anything even better than being on that in front of, on those steps in front of the museum in that plaza, which is the heart of our Balboa Park. And, mm -hmm. and I think that it will be so welcomed and so wonderful. So I, I congratulate you all, and I thank you for for being a part of of San Diego Pride and adding one more facet to the LGBT community, which um, those of us like myself and, and Lucas, and I won't speak for anybody else, but I, I, I think that it's so important to know that, well, yes, we do know that we are everywhere, but the impact that we can have to share our knowledge, our professional expertise, along with our personal um, trajectory, um, being whole human beings in this American society, this great American experiment. And what better way than right in the heart of that part <coughs> where um, pride celebrations have been happening for decades. So I think it's great. Is there anything, any final shots that you'd like to add? Any final things that you'd like to add going forward? I think I'm good. I think I'm so good. too. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. And I say happy pride to you and to our viewers. And we'll all look forward to going to the museum when those doors open again. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so it was much. Lovely speaking to you. Same here. Yeah. All right, thank you all so, so, so much. I, as a, a super huge nerd in all of the ways, um, I love getting a chance to nerd out on art history and arts with y'all. This is not a topic that I get to nerd out on a lot. And so thank you all for, for taking me there today and taking the rest of us there as well. And so um, per Larry's suggestion, any other museums in and around in Balboa Park around San Diego that would like to partner with San Diego Pride? Oh, wow, do we wanna partner with you? Um, I used to work in Balboa Park. I have a deep, deep love for all of the museums in that park. Um, Hi, San Diego Natural History Museum. And so if you wanna partner with us, just get in contact with us, um, info at sdpride.org or at our, uh, on our website. 
And um, if you want to hear more and learn more about San Diego Museum of Art and what they're doing, all of the amazing work that they're doing as in the LGBTQ community, and then also just as we figure out what museum visits and engagement is going to look like uh, during and eventually after this pandemic, uh, their website is on the bottom of your screen at sdmart.org. And I also just wanted to take a quick opportunity to plug, um, like we have amazing arts uh, institutions here in San Diego, including other folks in the in the um, in Bubble Park and also around the city. And I also want to lift up uh, that I've seen increasingly more. Um, I think during the pandemics, everyone goes uh, digital and things kind of spread a bit more. I've seen Black artists find these these collectives and ways to really showcase their work, especially Black LGBTQ artists. Uh, one that I really love that I follow and that I encourage you all to follow as well is called Black Trans Femmes in the Arts. And uh, and then any other Black uh, black queer artists that you find, um, but you can find them on Instagram is kind of their main, main presence. And that's at BTFA Collective on Instagram. That's on the bottom of your screen as well. So support Supporting Black Lives Matter means supporting Black lives as they're here, which means supporting Black artists. And this is one opportunity to do so. So with that, thank you all again so much for joining us. Uh, quick other save the dates before next year's Out on the Steps event is uh, tomorrow, SheFest will be streaming live as well. And you can find all of our live events at sdpride.org slash live. So SheFest will be tomorrow, Saturday, July 11th. Next week is, and then that kicks off our full week of amazing Pride events that will, because pandemic, all be virtual. Uh, so we have Light Up the Cathedral, which is our interfaith LGBTQ, uh, uh, our interfaith LGBTQ celebration on Wednesday, July 15th. My baby, the uh, Spirit of Stonewall Rally, will be live on Friday, July 17th. And then of course the big main show, uh, Pride Live will be on Saturday, July 18th. And I encourage you to tune in for all of those things as we showcase and find ways to still celebrate our pride in our amazing, beautiful LGBTQ community, even if we have to do that virtually and connect with y'all virtually. Thank you so much.